for joining us. This is uh, Andy Armacost, UND's president. And uh, this is uh, an exciting time for us to kick off the semester and share with you all the information about what's going on on campus. And uh, I'm uh, joining you from the university house here on campus. And uh, it's, uh, it's just great that you set aside the time to have this conversation. There's a whole lot going on around here. There's um, work going on with respect to fighting COVID. Uh, we have uh, a new testing strategy that we'll tell you all about. We have uh, vaccinations that are coming our way as well. And uh, in addition uh, to that, uh, we, we're beginning an important legislative session for, um, for the, the state. And this is an exciting time for us to share the case of the University of North Dakota with our state legislators. And, and they're just a tremendous group who devote a lot of time and we're eager to work alongside them to make sure that the, the interests and the needs of the university are taken care of. So it's a, an exciting time for us. And then I should also draw attention to um, the fact that Monday when I'll be testifying at the, at the state house, um, it, it's also Martin Luther King Day. And uh, so just a great reminder for us to, to uh, think about the, the meaning of, of what he brought to our society in terms of uh, searching for um, equity and fairness for all, but in addition, uh, doing it in a nonviolent way. And you've seen my messages in the past about um, avoiding violence when, uh, regardless of, of what the political cause, making sure that, um, that we uh, do so in a, in a in a smart way that doesn't harm other people. So, um, so celebrate that. Read read his speech as I have a dream speech. I think there might be some words of wisdom for all of us in there. So, um, anyhow, uh, we have the whole team here. Just like in the last couple times we've gotten together, it's exciting to have um, such a great group of leaders join us and and to to really take uh, take um, your questions and to be able to provide great answers and great information for you. It's this is about you. And uh, we're happy uh, you're with us. And uh, I'll turn it over to, I think, uh, Cassie Gerhardt, who's going to be our moderator again this evening. Cassie, thank you for being here. Thanks, President Armacost. Um, and again, greetings, everybody. Um, we're going to get started tonight. And as we have in the past, if you've got questions for us, please feel free to add those to the Q&A. And we will get them asked or some of them, my colleagues who are here may answer them in the chat. So um, we will do what we can, but we will stick around to get everybody's questions answered. I will remind you that we are recording tonight's session and in the very near future, we will post this online for future reference. Um, to my colleagues who are going to answer questions, I would ask you to introduce yourself just in case people aren't aware of who you are. So we welcome questions really on any topic tonight. And so please submit them. Um, as questions start to come in, I'm actually gonna start with one that I, a couple of them that I got from students in a meeting just a little bit ago. Um, Rosie, I'm gonna give these to you. Um, two questions. So the first question I got is, can you explain to everybody who's listening tonight, if people have had COVID in the past, when, what does it mean to start having to go to testing? Do they need to get tested again? What does it mean if we've had COVID and then re-engaging in a testing protocol? Um, with the testing, once you've had COVID and you pass, you have what's called a 90 day period of presumed immunity. At that time, you're exempt from testing or quarantine or anything else, provided you don't get really sick again. If during those 90 days, you become really sick, you should seek help from a medical provider. And after ruling out other illnesses, they may test you again for COVID. However, after those 90 days, we consider you back to um, step one. Um, at that point, you should resume your testing. Um, and if you would be identified as a close contact, you would be asked to quarantine. Uh, you basically start all over after those 90 days. As far as testing, I, that's for the general I, I would say uh, Bill Chase probably has information about athletics. They have a little different testing regime, um, but they are testing regularly as well. Uh, for those of us listening, those of you listening, pretty much after 90 days, start like you never had it before. Thanks, Rosie. Dr. Halbert, I'm gonna take this next question to you. Um, this week, students are back on campus um, and we have already have students, the question is, um, students who are seeing others on campus not wearing face coverings, both inside and outside of buildings, um, maybe more so than even what they saw last semester. So the question is, what's going on? So could you please highlight where the university is asked at, excuse me, with um, face coverings currently, if you would highlight that, please. Sure, my name is Carol Holger and I serve as the Vice President for Student Affairs and Diversity. And really nothing has changed on campus and face coverings are still required. Uh, on campus and in the classroom. 
So what we would ask is that you continue to follow that protocol. And uh, as we all get reacclimated to campus, we will continue to send those messages to remind people that this is the best way about uh, mitigating COVID on campus, which is still very much a concern for us. Dr. Hogan, while we're there, because I know we're going to get this question, because eventually we'll get questions about the vaccination. If people get vaccinated, do they need to wear face coverings? Yes, they do. And um, I've heard this from some of my colleagues, and I'm going to actually turn this over to Rosie uh, Do because I think Rosie will give a by far better explanation on this than I will. So Rosie? Hi, I should have introduced myself last time. I forget this every time. I'm Rosie Do. I'm director of UND clinical COVID response. Um, so anyway, back to the question about should people who receive vaccine wear face coverings? Yes, you do need to absolutely continue wearing face coverings. We know that the vaccine protects us at about after a second shot, roughly about 95% effective in knowing that it prevents us from getting severe clinical illness. However, we don't know for sure about the risk of transmission to others meaning I probably won't get really sick, but I still have an opportunity to be passing COVID to others. So to protect everybody until we have um, a greater volume of people, a greater percentage of people immune um, and immunized, we need to continue wearing our face coverings. Rosie, while you've got your mic open, I've got another question for you. Rosie, any idea of what percent of our out-of-state students who left North Dakota for the winter break have tested for COVID upon their return to North Dakota? Okay, I have to say I was getting distracted when Kara was answering that question because I was reading that question in the Q&A. I, I honestly have no idea what percent. I know that our testing, um, the, the drive for testing from students, general public, everybody has been decreased. Uh, there are a couple reasons for that. We, we fear that there is some COVID fatigue. That's what we're hearing from students that they are experiencing COVID fatigue. Um, and they're also, we're fortunately in kind of a lull of not a real high positivity rate, not a high case rate. So people have um, perhaps become a little bit more complacent or feeling not so strongly the need to test. Uh, we are very cautious and concerned about that complacency. Um, we don't know that we have turned the corner on COVID at all. We don't know if we're in the bottom of the U and uh, we are way up again. Um, so we just want people to really continue testing, continue taking the personal precautions to keep us all safe. Thanks, Rosie. I will just add, if people are interested in um, uh, information on our testing events, all of that is posted on the COVID dashboard. So the number of individuals, a breakdown of whether they're students, staff, faculty, or community members, all of that is posted after each testing event. And so lots of information, though it doesn't break down whether people are in state, out of state, but there is information on the dashboard regarding that. President Armacas, I've got a question for you. If the new administration proposes, and I think this is talking at the federal level, so President Bi incoming President Biden, if the new administration proposes a more strict nationwide lockdown, will the university send everyone home again for mandatory remote learning? That's a, it sounds like a simple question. Um, it sounds like there's probably a very complicated answer to that. Um, I think it would depend upon what the mandate is. Um, without seeing any draft uh, language of, of such a mandate, that's really hard to answer. So we, everybody you see here, fought really hard to protect the members of our campus at all costs, testing, quarantining, isolation. Um, but I think the same group would fight really hard, and we have, to keep the campus going. Um, without having to send people home. And so there's this, this trade-off between um, safety of all the members of our campus and um, giving our students, our faculty and staff an environment in which they can thrive. And so I, I'm not gonna, I, I can't answer it, um, uh, but if we're mandated to close down, we might not have any choice, uh, but I think you'd get universal um, support among the players on this, this call that we would do everything we can uh, using all the safety precautions that we put into place, uh, the effectiveness of testing and contact tracing and quarantine and isolation, um, that we would uh, uh, fight very hard to keep our campus open, uh, provided that we can do so, uh, minimizing the risk to, to the people here.
So I don't know, it, Jed, you might also have some thoughts as the, the head of our, our COVID response group. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, uh, I think that, um, you know, by and large, uh, decisions about closure are really made when we have extremely high numbers of cases and uh, hospitalizations. And of course, right now we're, in a, we're really in a trough. We have fairly low numbers of both. So, uh, and it's probably worth remembering that uh, we were up into the 1800 per million cases at one point, extremely high numbers of hospitalizations and the campus stayed open. So it's a little hard to envision uh, other than the, you know, sort of collapse of the local healthcare system, uh, why we would close. And I think under those circumstances, we'd be the ones uh, probably driving that bus more than any, uh, you know, federal mandate or anything else. So I think these things are gonna be quite local. Uh, they'll be, and of course, we'll be uh, under the governance of the state as well as the uh, county. So I think really it's gonna be dependent upon what things look like as the spring progresses. And of course the hope is that people will continue to wear masks, they'll continue to socially distance and we'll have more and more people vaccinated and that will be an ameliorating effect uh, against uh, a big increase. But uh, we gotta all keep our eyes open. Thank you. A question, and I'm gonna throw it out, I'm gonna start with President Armacost, but certainly Vice President Hogren, Vice President Shivers, if you wanna chime in. The question is, other schools in North Dakota and surrounding states and areas including NDSU seem to be less strict with COVID protocols and procedures. Why is UND so strict while it seems like the COVID positives are relatively the same? Well, we value the health and safety of the people on our campus first and foremost. And there are very simple things you can do like wear a mask, wash your hands, keep a distance from others and avoid large groups. It's uh, really sim simple behavioral things that, that uh, the science has shown has an impact on the spread of the virus. And so uh, we take those precautions um, seriously. And um, it, uh, I, I think, I, I don't know that uh, NDSU or these other schools have uh, different guidelines and standards. In fact, I was on a call today with the other presidents and uh, I, I think we're in much closer alignment than what the question suggests. Not to argue with whoever asked the question, it's a fair question, um, but um, I think we've all been working hard. We know that the campuses have been beacons within their local communities for, for health and safety. And um, I, um, we, this group, many of the people in this group that you see uh, tonight are um, have been at the forefront of crafting those policies and making recommendations to me. So I'm comfortable where we are, we'll be prudent. Uh, but again, um, we have good measures in place that kept the campus open during some uh, pretty difficult times. May I add something, Cassie? Yes, please do, Dr. Wynn. Yes, I, hi everyone, Josh Wynn. Um, you, I head up uh, for the university system task force that deals with the smart restart, that is keeping the schools and universities open during the time of COVID. And at a meeting today, as an example of what President Armacost was talking about, there was uniform agreement that uh, we needed to continue, for instance, to be very careful about the use of masks, to continue the imperative to use masks, regardless of what might be going on elsewhere. So all of the campuses were in agreement that this is very important for the very reasons that the president mentioned. So I, I would just like to uh, sort of double down on his uh, uh, statement that really we're doing the prudent thing to protect students, faculty, and staff. Thank you. Thanks. And please keep the questions coming in. We're going to get to them. I'm trying to batch them in some similar topics. So if we haven't gotten to yours yet, just know we're going to try to keep on some threads. So on that same thread, Orlin, I've got a question for you. Someone's asked the question, why are students at UND not able to eat together in dining centers where perhaps they are able to do so at other institutions in the state? Oops. This is Orlin Rosas and I'm the Director of Dining Services. And I, I guess I just need to echo what President Armacost stated. I mean, you know, UND is concerned about the safety of the students and the, and the faculty and the staff and, and, you know, the safety precautions that are in place are really wearing masks and physical distancing. So, you know, that's the thing that UND is adhering to in, in all the public spaces and the dining centers are public spaces. So Cassie, can I add on to that too? Yeah. Um, echoing what's been said so far and taking it one step further. One of the things that people were asking about in the it chat, it looks like, well, why does it make a difference for us to have these COVID restrictions in the dining hall 
when we're going to go back to our rooms and we're going to hang out with other people. We understand that. At the same time, the COVID restrictions in the dining room are set up for those folks to be able to be there and be safe who choose not to go back and do that same thing. So again, it's about um, meeting the needs of, of all students and about um, ensuring that we have safe opportunities for all students in dining. And so again, that's part of the reason, well, not part of the reason, it's really the, the whole reason why we have the, uh, the parameters in place that we do. Thanks. President Armacost, a question um, for you, and this goes back to um, face coverings. So the state mask mandate expires on January 18th. Will UND keep its mask mandate or will we work with state and city leadership to, in order to work with city and um, state leadership to ensure we keep masks and not spread the virus? So I think this is from someone who wants us to keep the mask mandate in place. Well, as you know, we, we had a, a mask requirement on campus uh, before the state or the county or the city did. And um, uh, we will continue the mask mandate after, after if, if, the, if, if the plan is for, for at some point very soon for the governor or others to, to eliminate the mask mandate, we will certainly keep it on our campus. And it will be driven by what we think is the science and what we know to be the science and what we think is best. And, um, and so the mask mandate will be here till, uh, till we get um, what we think is the all clear signal from, uh, for our, from our medical professionals. Thanks. And Cassie, if I could just add to what the president said again, which is yes, as it currently stands, the state mask mandate does expire as indicated, but that doesn't mean that it might not be extended. The governor is having a press conference tomorrow at 3 p.m. So for people who are interested in that, you might want to tune in uh, to that press conference to see what might be developing. Thanks, Dr. Wynn. A couple of questions have come in related to the vaccination process. So Rosie, Dr. Wynn, I'm gonna pose these between the two of you. So the first one, if a person is known to have allergies, is it advisable to take the COVID vaccine or should they decline? Do you want Rosie, to, do you want to start? I, I can start and say that because yes. of allergies, it does not mean that you should not get the vaccine. If you're known to have allergies to any component of the vaccine, yes, we would not want to have you take the vaccine. However, I was before Dr. Wynn joined us, I was going to copy statements he made earlier today at the town hall about your risk of severe reaction. Dr. Wynn, would you care to elaborate on that? You gave such a good explanation of that at noon. Thanks so much, Rosie. Uh, so we know that with any vaccine, there is a risk of minor uh, uh, complications and very rarely severe complications. The most severe acute, that is right after you get the shot complication is known as anaphylaxis. And that's when the blood pressure falls precipitously and it can be quite dangerous. Uh, the good news is it's treatable, but it does occur rarely. For many vaccines, the frequency is one in a million doses. That's pretty rare. It appears the risk of anaphylaxis with at least the Pfizer vaccine, and we think it's probably true of the Moderna as well, although we don't know this, is somewhat higher. It may be a half a dozen in a million. Okay, so it's a little more common, but still extremely rare. I would agree with what Rosie just said about things. If you have a general allergy, that probably is not a contraindication to the vaccine. If you are allergic to any of the components, that is. And I would add that if you've ever had an anaphylactic reaction to anything, you need to check with your healthcare provider before getting the vaccine. But even, let me just emphasize this again, even if someone gets the most severe acute reaction of anaphylaxis, that is treatable. And that's why we insist that people who get vaccinated remain at the facility where they got vaccinated for a number of minutes following the vaccine so that even if you develop this severe complication, we can give you epinephrine and the other treatments. And since I have personally treated people with what otherwise would have been fatal anaphylaxis and they're walking around just fine now, 
I can tell you the treatment works and that this should not be a strong reason why you decline the vaccine. Thank you. Dr. Wynn, I'm going to come to you and Rosie with this one as well. Um, uh, and and I want, for those of uh, folks joining us, I know we're getting a couple of aviation-specific questions. We haven't asked them yet because we're connecting with some of our colleagues to get answers for you. So I, please know we know they're in the queue, and I know Provost Stores is working to get some answers, so we will come back to those. But this is one, Dr. Wynn, that you may be able to answer. Has the FAA approved a COVID vaccine? If so, will UND have that vaccine available for its flight students? Yeah, and I'm sorry, uh, Cassie, I don't know the specific FAA regulations. Let me mention to the student who's asking it, I actually am a pilot, I'm an ATP pilot, and I have a medical uh, certificate so that I fly and flew just two days ago. But as far as the specifics of the FAA, I don't know. My assumption would be that there would be no reason why uh, after getting a vaccine, you could still not fly. I don't know of any reason why that wouldn't be the case, but we will get the specific answer from one of the aviation medical experts and let you know. So Rosie, can we post that someplace when we get the definitive answer? Uh, I never wanna speak for the FAA without absolutely checking my references, but I do not imagine that it would be a problem but we will confirm that and let you know. We will do that. We're in, on the phone right now with some of our FAA folks, but if we don't have the answer on this form, it'll be posted on the um, transcription of this when it's on the, on the website. We will definitely get that answer. Thanks. I shouldn't have assumed Dr. Wynn, just because you're a doctor and a pilot, you would know that answer, but I took a shot. So I apologize, but we will get that answer for you. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. Um, I know a lot of questions coming in about vaccines. We're gonna come back. Jed, I'm gonna give this question to you. Question's been raised. Can staff safely assume that if working from home, we will stay this way through the spring semester and beyond until we have reached herd immunity or reached a threshold of vaccinated students, staff, faculty? I will also know, I know around here, we like to refer to it as flock immunity and not herd immunity. So. Um, Jed, your comments, though, about working remotely once we reach flock immunity. <laughs> well, I think, uh, you know, I'm not sure that I'm the person who can really define what flock community actually looks like or is, but I will say this. Uh, I think, you know, we, when you think about it, we've done a very careful job of really monitoring the downsize of this epidemic, right? Uh, we look at every, every day, we look at the statistics, we're understanding where we are in terms of the incidence and prevalence of disease. We're looking at hospitalization rates, et cetera. And we've actually uh, started in earnest to look the other way, which is when this is a nice thing to start to look at, which is, hey, you know, people are starting to get vaccinated. Uh, right now we're in a trough period, a low period. I don't think that we're at all confident we're gonna stay that way. I think probability is we're gonna see some or more resurgence of the disease, but we'll see. And we're just gonna keep an eye on all these indicators and, um, and also look at the number of people who've been vaccinated. So my guess is that eventually, uh, my hope would be, I'm not sure that these types of uh, infectious diseases ever go away. I don't think that would be a correct thing to think about. I think they may recede into the background where people who are more vulnerable to them have to be careful. People who are, you know, if, if, if depending on how long the vaccine lasts, this may be something that we'll be vaccinated for for a good long time to come, depending upon individual vulnerability, just like the, uh, hate to say it, similar to the flu, we'll see what happens. So I think we're gonna be careful in terms of uh, understanding how uh, much we can reopen. So I would say uh, we'll have to wait and see. I think uh, when you think about it, uh, going up in just before the uh, Thanksgiving season, we did have people coming back to work uh, there. And that was when we were in pretty high numbers. So for example, in Twomley, we had more people coming back to work than we do now. And as the numbers started to get bad, uh, you know, more and more people stayed home and the building is relatively empty at this time. Uh, so I think that we'll probably see a hybrid of people, uh, some people coming back to work because they would like to come back to work and we'll be judging uh, whether or not it's safe for them and working with them to ensure that people are safe. Uh, 
I will say though, you know, we're entering into a new time of work where uh, people will want to work. Some people are going to want to work remotely. They've discovered that it actually works quite well for them. And uh, I think uh, employers all over the world and certainly the United States will be dealing with this issue. So we'll have to see, you know, as we evolve and think about this, uh, you know, what, uh, what types of, uh, you know, work environments we're really going to evolve into. The world has changed a bit in terms of working. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I'd love to give you a more definitive answer to that, but the truth is we really have to watch and see and, and, and really understand what's going on. So we'll be cautious. Thanks. We've received a handful of questions um, really about academic instruction and how we're doing things. So Dr. Storrs, I'm gonna probably have a little rapid fire and send a few to you. And I know you're aware of some of these too as you watch the chat. So the first one, the ratio of in-person classes at UND is vastly different from other NDUS locations institutions. Why is that? Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining tonight. My name is Debbie Storrs, uh, the Interim Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs. So we have worked with the Office of Safety to uh, measure the safe distance between seats to ensure that uh, the classroom is a safe place to teach and learn. And that's what determined how many students could, could be in a classroom at any point in time. So uh, we literally, the safe, uh, safety uh, literally took a tape measure uh, in the summer and measured every classroom to ensure that we had the six feet distance necessary. So um, that's how that was planned. So related to that, has there been a chance, a change in percentage of in-person hybrid classes and online classes being offered to UND students this semester compared to the fall semester? Uh, there's a little bit more online courses than the fall. So there's about, Karen, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's about 70% on-campus hybrid courses and about 30% online. She's, she's nodding her head, so I got the answer right. Um, which is a slightly higher than in the fall. Uh, the other thing is many of our faculty when they're teaching the on-campus courses, not all but many will give students the option of whether they want to engage uh, completely remotely or not. So and that's the case, the faculty will determine that and you can certainly check with your faculty member. And what we found is that many students um, at a convenience or safety prefer to uh, engage in on-campus courses by distance in their residence hall or their apartment. Dr. Sturz, a question on the academic calendar. Is UND considering keeping students in class through spring break and letting them out earlier like other colleges are doing? No, we're not. At this point in time, we are planning our spring break and we will continue the typical academic calendar for spring semester. Great. We're gonna stay in the academic area. And I think Dr. Sturz, you were able to get some answers to a couple of aviation specific questions that have been raised. So first one is, are there plans for more FAA evaluators this spring? This person is hoping to see the backlog and the certification rides cleared up so aviation students can continue on schedule toward graduation, which has been delayed. Yeah, I phoned a friend in aviation, our Associate Dean Beth Bierke, uh, who is driving and answered my phone call. And she said, we actually have more flight instructors this uh, semester and this year. And so we should not have a backlog. I did answer that question and gave the name of our chief flight instructor. So if that student or that parent has a question, they can call him directly. But uh, she said there shouldn't be significant wait lists. So if there is a concern, please contact um, either Associate Dean Beth Bjorki. And then again, I put uh, Jeremy's name and contact number in that uh, response. Great. President Armacost, Melanie Linder, I'm gonna take this one to you given this is an area that reports up through you all. Do we have any early info regarding plans for graduation either in May or August? Any early thoughts on where we're at in our planning for commencement in May or August? Do you want me to go ahead and take that, President Armacost? Go ahead. Sure. Um, we have been receiving a lot of questions regarding the spring commencement. Um, given the fluidity of the pandemic and how long it takes to plan a, the spring commencement, the decision was actually made just this week that spring commencement will once again be virtual. We are just now in the process of getting that information out. 
As far as summer, that has not been determined yet. Great, thanks, Melanie. Chelsea, I've got a question for you. What is being done to bring corporate recruiters together with graduating students? In particular, this person is interested in aviation students. So people who are already thinking of jobs um, post their graduation. Yeah, happy to answer that one. Hello, everyone. I'm Chelsea Melantine. I'm interim co-director right now for Career Services. Um, so we are certainly aware of the industry and kind of the economy and doing everything that we can to help prepare students for life post-graduation. So some of the things that Career Services helps with is resume reviews and cover letter writing. Uh, so please stop in and see our office um, Sorry, don't stop in and see your office. You can schedule, I apologize. You can schedule an appointment with us all um, through Starfish. And then we also have an online document review process that students can utilize. I'd also like to let students know about um, our upcoming career expo, which will take place virtually through our handshake platform on Tuesday, February 2nd from 1 to 7 p.m. We have over uh, 70 employers registered. And so um, we really encourage students to come out, network with those employers that are at that, uh, at that expo. We still have information sessions um, that we are offering through handshake as well. So encourage students to get out into our handshake platform. That is where we're posting all of our uh, information sessions. That's where we're hosting our expo um, and that's that's for aviation students all students on campus one other thing I'd like to add too is that we also serve alumni so perhaps you get a job post-graduation and you want to change careers because it's maybe something that oh this wasn't what I thought it was um, we will continue to serve you even well after your graduating year so please come back and see us if you have any questions thanks Chelsea Dr. Hallgren I'm going to go back to dining centers and I'm going to send this one to you so going back to where some of the conversations was or conversations were earlier, could the dining center ch changes could changes be made in the dining centers so that areas maybe upstairs in Wilkerson be distance in a section where students were comfortable sitting together would be able to could there be some different physical arrangements for students giving given their different comfort levels with COVID. So first of all, we know I, I appreciate that people want to be together. And there's nothing that we want more than to have opportunities for you to be together. And at the same time, we need to do so in a way that's safe. So while we're not in a position now to be able to create those kinds of circumstances, because while those people who may choose to sit together are okay, they still pose a risk for those people who are working in the dining center and other, people's who, other people who share that space. But you need to know that, that the pandemic uh, group continues to meet daily. We continue to have these conversations about ways to um, ensure that we're providing the greatest opportunity for students while promoting the greatest safety. So we're not there yet, but there's nothing more than we would love than for you all to be able to hang out together in the dining center. And we hope that uh, someday soon we'll be able to do that again. Thanks. Rosie, a couple of questions about the um, vaccine that have come in. When do you feel vaccines will be available to the UND student body? Actually, I wish I could be more promising, but it's very possible the general student body, um, the healthy people will not be receiving vaccines till even potentially the third quarter of this year. Um, definitely not before late spring and maybe even summer. Um, that could all change. We, you know, we're hearing things um, with the new uh, rollout of not holding the second doses as we have started our vaccination with the federal regulations. Um, there's discussion about releasing those second doses to offer first doses to people. Right now at this moment, I would expect late spring or summer. Could change tonight, tomorrow. Rosie, I think you've got an update as well regarding the vaccine related to the FAA. I do, thank you. Um, I heard from both of our aviation medical examiners at Student Health, and there are currently two vaccines that are approved, um, the Moderna and the Pfizer. Both of those vaccines are approved for airmen and for ATCs, provided proper safe, additional safety Safety precautions that include uh, staying in the site of the exam of the shot for 15 minutes to, as Dr. Wynn explained, watch for reaction. In addition, 48 hours of no fly or no safety um, activity following the shot. 
which likely includes no tower work if you're an ATC for 48 hours after your shot. So no flying and no safety work for two days following. Thanks, Rosie. President Armacost, a question about the potential for the vaccine to be required. Would UND legally be able to require students to get vaccinated for COVID? How would this be enforced and what would be done if they refuse to get the vaccine? From what I, I understand about North Dakota Century Code, um, requiring students uh, to be vaccinated for any vaccine that the state would want to specify has to be in the Century Code. And so this would actually require legislative change uh, to make that happen. So currently it's not required. And unless that happens, which I don't believe there'll be a push from the university system, you know, the entire North Dakota university system uh, to make that request. So uh, for, uh, my best guess is it won't be required. And that's probably an enduring answer. Josh, I don't know if you have any other insights. No, I think I, I would agree with you, President Armacost. Uh, I, I don't expect that it'll be required at the state level. Let me just mention, though, that if the state were to mandate it, if that were to occur in law, this has been adjudicated by the Supreme Court, and that is legal. So if the state chose to do it, uh, it could be mandated. Uh, my expectation is that that will not happen. Great, thanks. Um, Melanie, I know there's been a follow-up about commencement. If people aren't able to um, uh, in, be involved in person in this upcoming commencement, future conversations about their ability to return to have that um, in-person experience? Yes, and I should have brought that up when I, when I answered the first question. Of of course, we understand that participating in commencement and having the opportunity to walk across the stage to receive your diploma is just one of those major moments in one's college career. And yes, when in-person ceremonies resume, anyone who has missed that opportunity because the ceremony was virtual will be welcome back to participate. Thanks for clarifying. We're getting a couple of questions and, I, and probably through some different lenses, I'm gonna to look to um, uh, Provost Storrs, uh, President Armacost, Dr. Hogren, Vice President Shivers. Questions coming in related to, as North Dakota loosens some of its guidelines, why are we continuing to be so strict? If the safest place for students is in the classroom in light of the restrictions, um, can't we loosen those up a little bit in light of what people are seeing in the community? So if you could just speak to that, maybe Dr. Storrs, you could speak to it from the classroom and our plans there. It's people looking for some of those restrictions to be loosened the same way they're seeing them um, perhaps in restaurants and other off-campus locations. Sure, hi everybody. I'd be happy to try to answer this question. You know, um, as President Armacost said, we're, pr we're prioritizing health and safety. And remember, uh, we're, we're also thinking about our faculty who are, um, are older and uh, may have some health conditions. And so we wanna make sure that they're protected as much as possible. The, the classroom is one of the safest spaces because we've got the distancing, we've got the mask, we've got the plexiglass. Uh, and so we believe it's a very safe place. At the same time, given what we know about COVID and what we don't know about COVID, we want to continue to uh, use our safety protocol because it's important for, for us to protect the safety of all of the campus members, including students and our staff and our faculty who might be at higher risk because they're older. Others that anybody else wants to offer in terms of restrictions, Dr. Hogger and Jed? Sounds good. Um, another question about housing and dining. Um, so between Troy, Orland, I, Kara, I've got a few parts to this. With the dining centers not allowing students together and also not much going on in the residence halls for social activity, is there a concern that most freshmen will choose to live off campus as sophomores? I know it is a room reselection currently and it is very hard to justify for my student with all of the restrictions. So Troy, maybe if you want to speak to what you're seeing in the residence halls and the um, recontracting process. Yeah, thank you, Cassie. My name is Troy Nolder. I'm Director of Housing and Residence Life at the University of North Dakota. I'm glad to be here. Uh, we, know, we know it's been a challenging year for students, um, and it's not the type of experience that um, students were, were exactly expecting, not the type of experience that we're usually uh, used to providing as well. Um, I, I do want to clear up one thing with that is that there, there is social activity happening in the residence halls. 
Um, there was social activity that was happening last semester and we will continue to provide social activity. The difference is, is the in-person nature versus the virtual nature and the, the types of activities that we're able to do. Uh, and we're hopeful that as COVID maybe changes or vaccinations become more available, hopefully we'll be able to change to, to meet those changing circumstances as well. But we're gonna to continue to offer events. We offered over 300 events last semester in the residence halls. Um, we had over 4,000 students participate in events throughout the semester. And so we did have activities happen. They just weren't in the traditional in-person format. Um, so we do hope that next year we will be back into whatever the new normal is gonna be with double occupancy in our residence halls, students with roommates. Um, hopefully we won't be in a situation where we're offering, having to have all these restrictions in place. We don't know exactly what the future is gonna hold, but I think we're all hoping for the best moving forward here. Um, what I would hope is, is that students don't judge their experience completely on this year in the residence halls. Renewal is coming up for next year. Um, we understand that this isn't the experience that we that they probably had in mind, but we hope that they can come back and try us out for another year. We're trying to put some things in place for our students who have a private room this year. We're gonna to continue to offer them a private room next year at the current rate for a double room. So they aren't gonna to have to pay that premium next year for a double room if they come back because we, we want them to have the experience on campus again. Um, and so we're gonna do some things to try and give them hopefully the incentive to come back and try us in, in a more normal situation so we can give them the experience that maybe they were expecting to have this year. So, but don't give up on us yet. Um, we're, we're gonna still provide a great experience for your students and we'd love to have them back for another year with us. Orlin, a question related to the dining centers for you. Since no changes are being made to the dining centers, will students be allowed to change their dining plans for the spring semester? And we, we always allow um, board plan changes at the start of spring semester. Uh, they, they can fill out a form actually at the, uh, the cashier stand at, at Wilkinson Esquire's Dining Center, or they can email dining directly at dining at und.edu, you know, and, and just to, you know, kind of tag on a little bit to what, you know, Troy was stating about, you know, next year, I mean, we all understand that this year has been challenging and that students aren't necessarily getting the experience that they would like to have or we would like them to have. But, you know, we've got some exciting things happening next year, I guess, with the uh, with dining, uh, you know, with the Memorial Union opening up. I mean, there's going to be some uh, exceptional dining options in that building with the addition of uh, Chick-fil-A and Panda Express. And then also there's going to be a Starbucks in that building. So, you know, we're really looking forward to those types of operations opening up and also finding ways and, and creating ways so that students that have meal plans that are living in the residence halls can use their meal plans over in the student union. Trying to cr create that, uh, I guess that convenience for them, their, that mobility so that when they're on that end of campus that they'll be able to use those meal plans. Orlin, uh, a question was posed. Um, a student who um, left after Thanksgiving and anticipated getting a partial refund to their dining plan, but has not seen that posted, who should that individual contact with questions? They can also, you just email directly at uh, dining, you and, uh, dining at und.edu and that'll get forward to the right individual. Sounds good, we'll help you out whoever raised that question, thank you. We had a question raised about rush week, and I'm going to assume by rush week we mean fraternity and sorority recruitment um, and asking if that is happening. <clears throat> yes, recruitment is happening this spring. In most cases, our individual Ooh. chapters will be coordinating those events in their off-campus locations. And so information will be available, but yes, recruitment activity is happening in a little bit different way, but those are all in the spring semester um, facilitated by the individual um, organizations, typically at their off-campus properties. So yes, it is happening. Dr. Wynn, I've got a question specific to you. Um, and this is one of those, I think, looking for a medical opinion. So likely you're the only one in the panel that should um, ask it. Um, what are your thoughts about the new CDC requirements starting January 26th, that if we travel internationally, that we not only have to have a COVID negative test, but we also have to have a letter from our healthcare provider. Seems like that will consume a lot of healthcare providers time. Hmm, well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the, for the question. I'm not, uh, I actually haven't uh, seen the CDC guidelines, so I'm not familiar with, with all of the specifics. Um, certainly, given the transmissibility of some of these variants where they appear to be very transmissible, 
trying to stamp down on that would seem to be appropriate. So for the first part of it, having uh, a negative test, that seems quite appropriate to me. As far as the letter, uh, without having read the specific CDC guideline, I actually would share, would share some of your concerns as to the, 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 uh, the um, benefit of that, because that's not entirely clear to me. So let me do a little checking and we'll, I'll post a response because it's n I, I'm not familiar and I'm not sure. Uh, but again, the negative test is quite appropriate. Uh, and I have no problem with that as far as a, a, a letter from a physician or other healthcare provider. Uh, I, I, am, I also have some reservations and I'll look into it and get back to you. Sorry, I can't give a more definitive answer. I might add a little, I might add a little bit to that. Um, I, I didn't memorize those guidelines either, but I think I know specifically a letter was requested if somebody is in their 90 days of presumed immunity. Um, I, oh. don't, I don't know if it's required for a negative test. A negative test, I know that they have to have their name, their date of the test, the kind of test, some of those specifics, but I could be wrong. You'll check into this when you read the guidelines, but the letter may be um, required for proof that they're in that presumed immunity period. It may not be for all people that are flying. And, and that would make more sense to me, Rosie, and I, I, I'd probably be okay to th with that, but that would apply to only a, a small minority of people who are traveling. But we'll get clarification on it uh, so that we can give you our interpretation of it. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks, Rosie. The person knew enough to raise that one specifically to Dr. Wynn and none of us for the medical advice. So that was good in the chat. It was specifically to the Dr. Wynn. So thank you, Dr. Wynn. And Rosie, thanks for... Um, your additional clarification. We have um, answered all the questions that have been posed in the Q&A. So we've got about 11 more minutes scheduled. Um, we are happy to stand to ask questions, but I also wanna do the um, call out. If you have a question you would like us to ask, please add it to the Q&A. Um, I see one right now. So before it even gets sent to me in other ways, I'll just read it. Um, um, maybe a few different perspectives. I, I know Troy has talked about a little bit with housing and others, um, Provost Storrs, you might have some thoughts, Dr. Hogren. What is UND doing to keep freshmen at UND after a year like this? Other colleges are taking a different path and are more appealing, and my daughter is doubting her selection of UND. Yeah, I'd like um, Karen Plum, Vice Provost Plum, to answer this question because, you know, we care we care deeply about our students, and I'm sorry to hear uh, your consideration, your frustration with your experience. We want you to stay at UND. We know that we provide incredible learning opportunities. Uh, we also don't want this pandemic to disrupt your experience, but we know it has. And I know uh, Vice Provost Plum's team has done a lot of outreach, and they also have additional plans to help support students. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to, to Karen for some additional information. Hey everyone, I'm Karen Plum. I'm the Vice Provost for Student Success. Um, as Dr. Storrs mentioned, we have been working with advisors across campus on the academic pieces and the changes to classrooms and taking classes online and all of those pieces that nobody really looked for or anticipated. Uh, we do have some learning specialists that have been working with students who are struggling with how do I do online classes successfully? Um, we've been reaching out to students who are struggling. Advisors have been reaching out to students who are struggling. Um, we get notifications if instructors are uh, noting that students aren't doing as well in courses as they might, as they might expect them to. Um, so a lot of that outreach on the academic end. Um, I know that we have partnered with Student Affairs as well with a student support team. So students that are really struggling um, with multiple classes and multiple issues. We have a team of folks reaching out to them uh, to make sure that they are being supported as well. Um, trying to just make sure that we're as flexible as we can possibly be for students. We know that this is a hard year. Uh, we know that it's been difficult for everyone and um, trying to make sure that everybody gets through it successfully has been our goal. Thanks. Becky, I think you asked that question. If there's anything specifically we can do, send me an email. Just put a dot between my first and last name at und.edu. And if there's something specifically we can do to help your student, please let me know. And I will get in contact with my colleagues and we'll do what we can. 
um, UND is the right place for her and we're happy to help uh, remind her of that. I, again, don't have additional questions in the queue, so I'm kind of looking around. Um, President Armacos, anything you are hoping to be able to share or answer, and we just didn't get the right question asked tonight to put you on the spot to ask it? Yeah, well, just uh, two quick observations on that last question about um, uh, your daughter who um, might is questioning whether this is the right place. Um, the care and concern that everybody on this call and, and everybody, I'm, I'm new, right? I, I showed up as president this summer. I've seen nothing but love and support uh, from the faculty and staff to make sure the needs of our students are taken care of. And I would love to know more when you, when you send it to Cassie, put it uh, to me too, or, or to Debbie Stores as well. We'd love to know um, what, and Kara Hallgren and, and uh, who else is here? Put, out, put all of us on it. Um, we'd love to know what pathway other schools are taking um, because we've received other feedback from parents who have said, we're so happy with the path that you're taking because we feel our other child is at a school that's quite reckless and isn't taking these needs so seriously. So we're trying to strike that, that balance. In fact, when the, when the surge of infections happened in late August, early September, and again um, in November, uh, we fought like mad to keep the, the campus open uh, to, to not revert uh, to sending people home. Uh, and uh, we debated it. We, we came up with what we thought was reasonable. The systems we have in place really held tight. Uh, we've worked hard to make sure that uh, our students are gonna get the support that they need. So we would love to more, hear more from you about the specific pathway that other schools are going that might be more appealing and, uh, and address those with you. I, I, again, the love and support from this group for for all students on campus is just truly incredible. And uh, we would love to see your daughter stay here and, uh, and bear with it. We're all, as Debbie Storrs said, um, we're all working through this and uh, we've never seen a pandemic like this um, and, um, and, and the impact on our whole society. So um, the other thing I wanted to comment on too is there were a lot of comments about why can't we just get rid of the mask mandate? Why can't we just follow the state uh, aggressively and just be done with it all? And that sense of urgency is natural. I think we all feel it. We want it to be over, um, uh, but we're finding ways to connect with each other unlike we've, we've done in the past. Um, but let's apply that same sense of urgency to do the things that we need to do to get out of this, right? The same sense of urgency to, to test and keep the spread in check, the same sense of urgency to get vaccinated when the vaccines are available. And, and the sooner we can do that, that same sense of urgency that many have described, let's just be done with it. I agree, let's be done with it. But we have to do it the right way and make sure that we keep people safe. One final comment too. I know uh, Provost Storrs had indicated uh, the most vulnerable. We, we talk about our professors as well. Um, among the student body, there are vulnerable students in numbers that you probably don't realize. Diabetics, asthma, dot, dot, dot. Um, the number numbers of students with, with health conditions is much greater than I think what I had ever imagined. And, um, and so we need to keep them at the forefront of our thoughts as well, because they're the ones interacting with all the healthy students, right? The invincible students. And so let's take care of them as well. Together we can do this and uh, be patient. Um, we love your students, we love you, and uh, we'll, um, we'll, uh, we'll get through this together. All right. Thanks, President Arbacas. I will say um, a note on behalf of all my colleagues, thank you for all the kind comments that you are sharing in the chat with us. Um, many of you respond with kind comments to Christy Okerlin when she sends out the parents newsletter. We try to share those um, when you name our colleagues or academic departments, and so thank you. Um, I will just remind everybody, we truly see this as a partnership. We know we have a number of parents on the line with us tonight and students. We do this all together, and so we appreciate you all taking time to be with us tonight and to raise questions. Before we go, I do want to remind people, we have two more town halls planned for this semester. So our next one is scheduled for Tuesday, March the 9th. Again, the same time, the six o'clock central time. That one right before the spring break. So if we can answer questions in that area. And then we have our um, third one planned for Tuesday night, May 4th. So right before we head into finals week and the um, summer break, uh, we are hoping to answer any questions. If for some reason there is the need and desire to have one before then or something else changes, we can certainly get something scheduled, but we have planned those two additional town halls um, for yet this semester. And at any time, you don't need to wait for these events to ask us questions. Again, if you get a question to me or to Christy or as President Armacost said, anyone here, um, 
we are happy to answer your questions or get it to our colleagues who can answer those questions. So thank you again for all the sweet comments that you're posting in the chat. We certainly appreciate it. I am not seeing another um, question. So Dr. Wynn is confirming that what Rosie shared is right. So way to go, Dr. Wynn, in approving um, what Rosie said. That's awesome. I appreciate it. Other things, anybody? I don't think I've got other questions, and so I want to be mindful of time. For those of you who are joining us from other parts of the country, we're waiting for a good old North Dakota blizzard to hit here tonight. We're supposed to get a little bit of snow, maybe, and lots of wind. And so it's just called January in North Dakota, and we've avoided it for 14 days, but it sounds like it might arrive this evening. So um, President Armacost, now you're going to start to see what winter in North Dakota is really like. This has been um, a treat the last few weeks for those of you not um, in North Dakota. All right, with that, I am going to say good evening, everybody. Thank you to my colleagues. Thanks to everybody who joined us. Have a great spring semester. Stay well, get tested, and when it's your turn, get vaccinated for COVID. Be well, everybody. <laughs>